Hello, good afternoon. We're starting in time. Uh, welcome here at Bergen Kunsthal uh, and on the live stream. That's why we're starting so uh, punctually. Um, we opened yesterday uh, two new exhibitions by Sitzel Meinecke Hansen and Martin Sims. And we gathered here for uh, the traditional um, Saturday after the exhibition opening uh, conversation uh, in which we focus on uh, an aspect uh, within uh, these shows. We focus today on um, Martin Sims' show, uh, She Mad Season 1, which uh, runs until January. Um, more specifically, we focus on um, an aspect in uh, her work, which is uh, television or media culture. And um, we wanted to dig a bit deeper into that, uh, why this could be um, relevant to discuss what artists' interests are in TV, what uh, the kind of discussions are that could be led uh, through the medium of TV. Um, Maybe I start by uh, uh, showing a few images uh, of um, this exhibition. Uh, we see um, here um, one of the works that's also in the uh, exhibition, uh, She Mad, a pilot for a show about nowhere, which is um, uh, one of the earlier works. It's uh, a pilot uh, for an imaginary fictional um, series that um, Martinez developed and this, that this um, exhibition is uh, focusing on. It's um, a kind of video essay, but also uh, in itself, in its format, uh, a pitch uh, to propose uh, a new sitcom. And it talks a lot about uh, uh, sitcom and um, the politics embedded in uh, sitcom. Then uh, a few stills here. This was an installation view uh, when it was first presented in, um, at the New Museum uh, Triennial, together with research material. Then um, a second work, uh, She Met Laughing Gas, that's the second episode, um, uh, which has a slightly different focus. It's uh, based on early Hollywood uh, uh, film, a silent film from 1907 by Edwin Porter that is kind of taken up uh, in which uh, an actress, and actually one of the first uh, black American actresses in a solo uh, uh, important uh, role, Bertha uh, Regustus, is uh, featured. And um, also some stills. Then uh, the fourth film, uh, Intro to Threat Modeling, which is um, going towards a direction that's more recent in um, Martin Sims' work, uh, a discussion on social media and uh, how we uh, tell a story about ourselves in uh, public media. Um, uh, Bitch Zone, also quite recent, uh, the fourth episode of She Mad, um, which is based on uh, a story, Tyra Banks, uh, on Tyra Banks, the supermodels, um, uh, an empowerment camp that uh, <laughs> Martine uh, tells a story about. And then now we actually have a short uh, video uh, walk through the exhibition downstairs. Um, we have a fifth episode now, which is uh, called The Non-Hero. It's uh, based on a TikTok uh, story, one minute long. Um, it's uh, literally based on uh, TikTok stories by Lil Nas X, um, My Life Story, a quite uh, or very famous uh, TikTok um, format or uh, feature. Yeah, and to discuss uh, some of these aspects and to also broaden the context of the discussion is, uh, in uh, this work, we um, have invited today two prominent guests who both work in Norway, but with different focus on TV culture and media theory. To my right is uh, Gri Rustad, who's uh, the head of further education and a senior researcher at the Norwegian Film and Television School at the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences. And uh, she has, uh, a post, but, uh, did a postdoc at the University of Oslo in television studies, where she also did her PhD. And she was for a year uh, an associate professor of media studies here at the Department of Informatics and Media Studies at the University of Bergen. That was last year, during the pandemic, so mostly uh, from <laughs> home office. Uh, in her research, she uh, focuses, for example, on American quality television, such as The Wire or Mad Men, like new uh, 
TV formats, but also um, on the cultural relevance of uh, the Norwegian skills, SCUM, and uh, web TV and alternative uh, distribution models. And she's also working on a book forthcoming on social media TV. And then, uh, uh, to my furthest right, uh, Tim Vermeulen, who's uh, born in the Netherlands and uh, works as a scholar and critic. He's a professor for media, culture, and society at the University of Oslo in Norway, um, where he teaches uh, critical and cultural theory, film, and television studies, and aesthetics. He worked before as an associate professor in culture studies and theory in Nijmegen uh, in the Netherlands. And he's also a co-founder of the website Notes on Metamodernism, and you've worked quite a bit on Metamodernism, and is a regular... <laughs> Yeah, or that's fair. Published, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, when you hear it back like that, it's, uh, you think, oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> and uh, is a regular uh, contributor to Freeze, and uh, he uh, has two books that are forthcoming. Um, once, one is called Hands on Time, Gesture as Temporal Form in U.S. Screen Media. Hands off time. Hands off time. You know, oh, yeah. The... And uh, um, a book on Richard Linklater. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I um, showed already some uh, images of uh, um, Martin's show, um, and we talked a bit, we had a look at it, but I, I guess the starting question uh, for me is, uh, why do you think is it interesting for um, artists to deal with uh, TV as a theme and um, as a format to appropriate an artistic production? Shall I, shall I open? Yes. I mean, this is, and I'm sure all of us have our own sort of feelings about this, but I think there's, there's two sides to this story. There's probably more, but there's definitely two. And we started talking about this 11 years ago at the Freeze Art Fair, where we did a talk with Aaron Schuster and, uh, and Melanie uh, Gilligan and John T. Claypool uh, to consider the different ways in which art and history has appropriated to work with television. And what was interesting at that moment, and I think it's still true today, is that until roughly the 2000s, you see that many artists use television, but they use it sort of derivatively, right? Television is the idiot box. It's the stupid things, right? It's what you look down on. It's the stuff that you might be embarrassed about if you come to school. It's not the stuff that you necessarily want to brag about. I watched the soap opera last night. And so television will be this sort of medium to criticize, to take apart, to show all kinds of lines of patriarchy or capital or consumerism or passivity, right? David Bowie lying on the sofa passively or any non Jung Pike piece, I guess. So it has a very distinct critical appropriation because TV was supposedly a um, stupid medium. And then what you see happening from roughly the 90s is a sort of different approach to television um, partly, I imagine, given in by changes within television, which is that television from roughly the 90s, for a number of reasons, the invention of the flat screen, better quality screens, uh, the nichification of uh, TV, very important, right? So in America especially, you would have all kinds of different branches where you could, um, you could sign a contract for HBO and you could watch sports, or you could um, sign a contract with Fox or take a... Take a monthly subscription and watch um, um, edgy comedy, right? And so you could, you could niche out. And so there would be niches for uh, African-American TV, girls between 18 and 25, right? So there would all be all kinds of niches. And also there would be a niche for people like, I'm sorry to say, but I'm guessing most of you, right? <laughs> Higher educated, uh, probably middle class background or some kind of middle class, up, uh, upper middle, middle class um, situation. Stuff like uh, The Wire later on, but first Hill Street Blues, Sopranos. So clever television, right? I mean, the tagline of HBO is not, uh, it's not out of nowhere. It's not TV, it's, it's HBO. It's because television wanted to be something else, right? It, it's still very much TV. But so TV becomes something differently as a result of all kinds of industrial changes. It affords itself to be something unlike that stupid television of the 60s and 70s. And interestingly, and Gri and I have written about this quite extensively, these changes conform to the typical changes that every single art form undergoes the moment it goes from mere entertainment, right, which is I'm doing this because of course it's, it's ridiculous to talk about it in any of those terms, but from entertainment to art, which is that it just becomes bourgeois. Right, so cinema in, uh, in the sort of the 60s and 70s, right, the, the sort of the aftermath of Italian neorealism and then Antonioni and the French, or literature earlier on uh, with the uh, emergence of the novel, 
it appropriates distinctly bourgeois aesthetic registers, and then it becomes something that, again, I'm guessing most of you might like. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm sure that most of us have seen the same sort of TV shows for obvious reasons. And so TV becomes clever. And so you see that also at that moment, the relationship of art and artists to television changes because they can't just ridicule it. I mean, it's difficult to ridicule the wire. Right? Because it's already so sort of it does so many things itself or the Sopranos or Mad Men. And so the relationship becomes less one of criticism of the medium as a gateway to consumerism, patriarchy, uh, late capital, and so on, and becomes more um, a sort of Mel Mel Melanie Gilligan-like interaction between the affordances of the medium and what it can do, what it can do perhaps better because of its seriality and so on and so forth. Um, and, and explore that more. Does that make sense? Sorry, that was a very yeah, long yeah. answer, <laughs> I realized. No, no, it's very good. <laughs> did, did you want something to, to, to add? Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, what Tim says is obviously correct, but um, what is interesting about uh, TV uh, is also that uh, because it had this idiot box uh, stamp on it, uh, it was usually... Uh, engaged with by women. So television studies as a field has always been a field driven by feminists and women who have not been like claiming it to be the idiot box or anything like that, but rather looked at the, the pleasures and the importance of television as a domestic medium. And I think that is also like uh, what Tim kind of forgot to mention is this gendering of television as a medium. And I think that is very important in this story as well, yeah. because what also happened when you got The Sopranos, The Wire, and all of these shows, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, was that you got male uh, protagonists. And that also helped raising the social status of TV. Uh, and also we got more male television yeah. scholars, whereas before it was something that women did in the universe. Universities. They were researching soap operas, they were researching sitcoms, uh, because um, it didn't have this cultural value that uh, men, so men didn't want to work with it, obviously. But for women and women culture, it was super important uh, also for the feminist movement. Like, a lot of soap operas, especially U.S. soap operas in the 70s and 80s, were very socially progressive. That's where you got the first abortion on screen. That's where you had the first gay man on screen. Uh, so, but but it was still kind of frowned, frowned upon uh, because it wasn't valuable. It was something for women to watch. Whereas the cinema was a public medium. It was something you went out and watched in the cinematheque. It was art. It was like in the festivals. Uh, but uh, television was a domestic medium and th therefore a medium for women. Uh, and I think yeah. Martine actually kind of comments upon that in her art, like she has this like understanding that television is a domestic form as yeah. well. And that the temporalities that are associated with that, with this idiot box, which I mean, of course, he <laughs> is completely right at the moment, it becomes bourgeois, becomes a male form, yeah. all right? I mean, still Foster Wallace or something in the 90s is shitting all over TV because it's not a male form, right? Um, and so... But the temporality of TV is also uniquely sort of, I mean, Kristeva talks about hysterical time, and this is really adopted in TV studies in those early days, that the whole temporality of television is different from the one that film or the novel engages, right? It's a more sort of circular time or a sort of middle time, right? The sitcom that Martine is working with is very much about the circularity. Soap opera, the other sort of key form of television, is about the eternal middle. It's this middle that never ends. There's no, there's no teleological endgame to television in the 1950s or 60s. Sorry, I, th yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I have a quick question, and which is um, maybe uh, adding an aspect, which is like w what you describe as um, the artification or the making bourgeois of uh, television. There's also, of course, there is also at the same time uh, an increased interest in uh, TV as a popular form, uh, like with the rise of uh, culture studies, for example, as an academic discipline with a heightened attention to the everyday, to um, with a, uh, a kind of um, questioning of uh, divisions of high and low culture, for example. Um, so you take, uh, TV is taken more seriously, 
uh, and also like uh, as a kind of popular uh, cultural format. And um, like the, the narratives that are embedded in, in TV, also in the idiot box, are maybe not, uh, you start to question the kind of uh, top down or the, uh, the, the way that uh, a power dynamic in TV is, has been understood, that it's a, a message that's, uh, uh, I don't know, hammered through to consumers. And you understand that um, TV works more as a kind of performative medium in which, um, to, so too has written about that uh, also watching TV is a productive uh, mm. uh, activity. So by watching TV, you actually do something with content, uh, you appropriate it. And um, it's actually interesting, like, it's one of the points that I think uh, also Martin addresses in her work uh, very explicitly, like how watching TV is also um, uh, determines is a co-determined in what TV is about. Like um, by, uh, for example, in, in, through uh, being a target audience or being, being uh, discovered as a target audience, TV changes. And that's not happening only uh, because uh, the makers are doing something differently, but also because the viewers, a different uh, group of viewers are discovered. They are targeted, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, The Wire is so beloved by, I'm guessing, so many of us, because it, it targets us. It was made explicitly for us. And I mean, that idiot box, I mean, I said that because that's the yeah, debate, yeah. right? But of course, I mean, Gri and I are TV scholars who do a lot with older forms yeah. of TV. They're obviously not, not bad at all, <laughs> but they are very distinctly embedded within social structures, whether it is indeed sort of gender or class, right? Both Gri and I grew up watching television with our parents nonstop. But that's a particular kind of class upbringing. That's perhaps not the class upbringing that upper middle class families might engage in, right? So it's a particular kind of class relationship. And what you see and what I, I mean, shall I answer the yeah. bourgeoisification? We wrote about yeah. this together. But the, what you see with television, the moment we move from, I don't know, sitcoms in the 80s and 90s to stuff like Seinfeld or Arrested Development later or Community or, you know, when you move from Law and Order to The Wire or when you move to The Sopranos or Mad Men, what you see, or uh, I May Destroy You, which uh, you have something to show up later, is what you see is a, a very distinct change from a, an oral-based medium, yeah, because TV comes from radio, so it's, it's initially... It's about talking hats and close-ups. Um, it's about static shots, very, very little editing, simple um, decors with little attention to detail because the screens were poor quality, because you were supposed to watch TV whilst doing other stuff in your house, vacuum cleaning or something, because this is the gendering of the medium. Um, and then what you see from the 90s is that all of those things change, and so television becomes less focused on the plot and more about the world, right? The Wire or Game of Thrones or something like that. It becomes less a collection of close-ups and more a variety of shots, like every, any, every film, right? You had Star Trek and Star Wars in the 70s. They're incomparable because of the kind of media that they're made for, right? Star Trek is talking heads, Star Wars is explosions. But of course, when you see then Battlestar mm -hmm. Galactica or sci-fi in the 90s, it becomes a different ball game because of all those changes. And so you see less, um, more attention to detail, more attention to the visual, more attention to the world as opposed to simply the main narrative, more attention to character development, breaking of the fourth wall. That is to say, all those things that novelists do when they begin to write novels, right? People compare it to Balzac or The Wire, or uh, to Dickens, or to Tolstoy, those serialized forms which did the same sort of thing. But you could equally compare it to modernist art, or indeed to Antonioni, right? Um, uh, who does the same, right? He comes too early, and he leaves too late. I, I don't mean it's <laughs> a sexual, uh, sexual thing, I, I hope, in any case. Right, but uh, right in, in, in Antonioni, the camera comes, and then you know, nothing happens. You sit there thinking, what's going on? Then something happens, and then nothing happens for a while, and only then you cut back, which goes entirely against the conventions of economy of storytelling. Right? Tarantino, a director that I think we both really dislike, or Christopher Nolan, or whatever, <laughs> right? they come at the moment the scene takes place, right? action, and then the moment the action is done, they cut away, because that's how you keep the pace going. Antonioni broke that entirely, and Mad Men does that as well, or The Wire does that as well. It comes really early, you see all kinds of shit, and then something happens that might well be the plot, and then you linger for a while. So you have those sort of those breaks, you might say, of the linearity of narrative. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, or I was thinking another interesting thing about TV, how it was and how it is, is that it has kind of been the 
the popular art form, right? It has been the shaper of entire countries' imaginations. Uh, this is what we, <laughs> and I'm sure that also middle class people watch like television <laughs> with their families, <laughs> uh, uh, primetime TV on Fridays and um, Saturdays. Uh, so it has kind of, and then you got this um, diversification for a while with quality TV and you got all of these niche audiences and uh, for a while there. But now you kind of see perhaps that television could yet again become this medium of monoculture so we can all talk about the same uh, program, say for example a program like Squid Game. And what is interesting is that before um, television was national mediums, right? You had perhaps some of the same uh, American sitcoms, like in Norway we also had Derek, so I guess we could talk about Germans, uh, talk with Germans about Derek, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it was I'll kind of, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like um, a national culture. You had the same formats, but they were nationalized. Like for instance, like all countries almost in the entire world have their own ver version of Idol or Big Brother, for example. So it's kind of nationalized, even though the formats are the same. But now with Netflix uh, and the internet, what you kind of see is that suddenly everyone in the entire world are watching the same show, like Game of Thrones, for example. You could, uh, whenever a new episode of Game of Thrones were released, you can talk about that with your friend in China or in Brazil. And you see that also with Squid Game now. This is something the entire world are watching. And I think that's kind of interesting with TV is this um, thing where it works somewhere between the global and the national and also these niches and also being this huge universal medium that creates um, monocultures. And I also think television, we are talking now a lot about drama and fiction, but television is so much more, more than fiction, right? Uh, so a, a very good example in Norway is what did you all do uh, when um, the terrorist attacks happened uh, on the 22nd of July, right? Unless you were in the middle of it, which I'm sorry to rip off, uh, rip, um, to remind you of. But most of us were just watching TV, and we were all watching then RK, right? So television also had that effect, and that's something that no other media does. This is where we go when something happens. Like, huge. We go to TV, and then we just sit and watch TV to try to figure out and understand the world. And I think that also might be a reason why artists are so drawn to TV as a medium, because it, this is the one, this is like the universal medium that brings us all together, right? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, <laughs> that is, I mean, I guess there's um, yeah, two levels of uh, relation to reality. There's like we watch uh, shows and uh, somewhere there's a kind of relation to the world as a depiction and it draws from the world, obviously, but it's also like this real, real life component, like we gather around uh, uh, TV sets and watch something uh, that's happening in that moment, like news. Yeah. But I guess, I mean, for, for, for this, um, uh, for, for Martin's practice, I guess, like the, the, the fiction is kind of uh, interesting, or the relation how, of between fiction and reality. Like, um, yeah, I didn't mention, but uh, all her mm -hmm. films are centered around uh, a fictional persona called also Martin, and uh, that persona also um, uh, is in her life in a similar position as uh, Martin, the real person. There's a kind of uh, uh, there's a mix or blur between what's real, what's fictional. Um, maybe um, I want to come back to one point we discussed uh, uh, earlier, the, uh, the theory of prosthetic memory. I think um, you mentioned, as, uh, because it comes up uh, frequently in, in writing about Martin and also mentioned by Martin as a reference. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, prosthetic memory is, the, I'm, I'm sure some of, some of us have heard of it. It's this notion by Alison Landsberg, um, that, that she developed um, 
distinctly or explicitly in relationship to the first Blade Runner uh, many, many years ago, but you know, called back a early cinema piece of cinema, The Thieving Hand, in which a thief, oh no, a man with one arm, uh, another arm attached itself to this man, but this arm used to belong to a thief, and so this arm begins to steal, right? Begins to steal unbeknownst to the man who the arm is now attached to. And the idea that uh, Alison took from this is that, um, for prosthetic memory, is that memory works the same way. We take on memories that aren't ours, but that are culturally given to us, right? So mass cultural memories specifically. Of course, in Blade Runner, this happens, right? With the, all the implanted memories for the, for the cyborgs, right? Uh, this, I think it's this thing with the piano. Someone uh, plays piano, but they, they don't have, they have never had a youth playing piano because they're a cyborg, but this is the implanted memory. And because the memory is there, it's real to you, right? And so she develops this notion of memory as a prosthesis, something that can be attached. And of course, in, the, in those works, we are seeing something similar. We're seeing a sort of a generational and very much racialized um, understanding of creating a memory and an understanding of yourself as being in the world through all of those fictional accounts, especially in this case, uh, the 90s, the 80s, perhaps some of the 70s. So I, I would say it's that. It's funny, I, we mentioned this before, that in some of the articles, Alison Landsberg is referred to as, as um, Angela Landsberg, which I'm guessing is because of Jessica Fletcher. I don't know, it's... Uh, <laughs> was Jessica Fletcher a thing in Norway? Yes. What, was it not? <laughs> yes, it was. Murder, she wrote, <laughs> Angela Lansbury? Okay, anyways. At least one person thinks it's a good joke. Yeah. <laughs> it was not as big as Derek. Once again. <laughs> Um, it wasn't as big as Derek, there because Derek was on the NRK, <laughs> but Jessica Fletcher was on TV3. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> less of an audience. <laughs> so, but then, um, I mean, so, uh, so the theory tries to find a way to describe how uh, uh, TV as a kind of everyday culture and a mass uh, media popular culture uh, shapes also our understanding of ourselves, but also of the world. Yeah, in the sense, I mean, this, and it should be understood within a very distinctly postmodern or postmodernized or plural or commodified or simulacral landscape, right? So she develops, Alison develops this notion of prosthetic memory, which she is now revising with me as it happens, but she's now revising very much to talk about the way in which memory works, collective memory works in the 80s and the 90s, right? So she's not making any claims about the 1920s or the 1930s. She's distinctly talking about the way memory operates, collective memory, in late, on the late capital, you might say. So the very distinct way in which memories are both loosened, right, like everything from their signifieds, and then begin to float and can sort of be reattached to everybody. Um, and this she links up also with, you know, with affective culture. I mean, all of us, I'm sure, share memories or collective senses of ourselves that don't belong to us. Right? Especially nowadays, I presume, we, we have those, those appropriated, consciously and unconsciously, or unwittingly appropriated <laughs> senses of ourself in history. Um, so this is where it comes from. I mean, you can see the psychoanalytic links very clearly as well, but uh, uh, the, the prosthetic memory doesn't go in there. But interesting, I mean, you mentioned the revision. What is the kind of, uh, what do you think uh, is... Uh well, so, so yeah. prosthetic memory is this notion that something is, is loose, right? So it's a floating, it's something, it's something that floats and you can attach it. Mm. But of course, you could also, I mean, this is a bit of a long story, but you could, you could imagine, so the, that's the thieving hand, right? So the thieving hand is an arm that belongs to someone that is reattached to someone else's body. So you're sort of mixing registers, you might say. But of course, that arm could also be artificial, Right? You could have an artificial arm that is reattached and that is planned in other ways. I mean, I think it's more about the pluralization or the opening up of that very distinct notion of the prosthesis to perhaps alternative memories or memories that... How many of you have seen the new Blade Runner? The Blade Runner 2049? I mean, I have to dig deep now in my memory. <laughs> uh, but I have to dig deep now to, to figure out what happened again. But with Ryan Gosling's character, he believes, in a part he believes he has a particular memory, right? For those of you who have seen this, he believes he has a particular memory, and he re entirely reorganizes his life based on that memory. The memory doesn't, not, doesn't turn out to be false, but it turns out to belong to someone else, someone who is not human but a cyborg. So there's a sort of a simulacral memory that creates depth in his life. So from the, from the flat, from the fake, 
you begin to re-envision depth or the possibility of meaning, which seems to be quite an interesting, right? If, if the 90s is all about that flattening process, whether that's Jameson or Hutchin or Icha Passan or Hal Foster, whomever you want to refer to, this sort of notion of flattening and scooping out all the meaning and all you've got left is these empty cartons of uh, yogurt and flat culture and mirrors and Jeff Koons and all that shit. This seems to be the, the attempt to, to somehow, even though you know there's no depth, to, to try and create the sensation of meaning once again behind it. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. Uh, that's all I can say about it now, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I guess what I, what I tried to get, get back to is like uh, now in, in uh, uh, how Martin uses uh, television, I guess it's uh, with this double understanding. On the one hand, uh, this is TV. This is like a story that somebody uh, invents. This is uh, a projection. Like if you talk, for example, about um, uh, race um, and how it's represented on TV, of course the stories that people write, this is fiction. Uh, still, it shapes a lot of how people understand race. So there are certain um, ideas, notions about race also uh, then become real because they uh, are experienced on TV and told to TV. It becomes a kind of larger narrative. Um, so I guess um, I'm trying to f figure out or uh, think through what you described now uh, as this uh, notion of uh, prosthetic memory, how that fits in also this... Um, uh, the fact that there is actually a social reality that's still uh, experienced through TV. Yeah, I mean, for example, I think it's in She Mad, um, where you see Oprah and Mary Tyler Moore. I think that's it, right? Mary yeah. Tyler Moore. Oprah, of course, being so in love with Mary Tyler Moore. And I mean, she sort of hangs up. Also, I, I don't know if, you, if anyone's read this Eva Ilus book about Oprah, which is amazing. But she hangs up a lot of her personal life according to those sort of rules of Mary Tyler Moore, who's a very distinctly white person from a very distinct class with a very distinct sort of upbringing. So it's sort of a, that's an appropriated memory, you might say, prosthetic memory that then begins to shape the way in which Oprah understands herself in the world, which is, of course, given that it's a register that perhaps is from a different region, from a different, uh, because I think Mary Tyler Moore comes from the sort of the more... Uh, um, not from the urban, uh, urban part of America, but from sort of more country, uh, distinctly middle class. So it, it creates a particular kind of model within you can work, which affords and limits also in distinct ways. Right? So I think prosthetic memory in that sense, it affords perhaps you to experience particular things, how to play piano, but it also limits you in very distinct mm -hmm. and of course, inevitably ideological uh, um, ways. Yeah, and then, I mean, this is like coming back to the question of like, why do artists uh, find TV interesting? I think it, it also has to do with uh, like actually having material, like uh, having um, something concrete to work with, uh, where you can speak about how race, for example, is constructed uh, as a category, as a notion uh, in in the public realm, and you can start working on it, and it has and it has this kind of. Um, uh, complicated relationship to reality. It's on the one hand fictional, but it has uh, these concrete, uh, it's a concrete reality that people experience. Maybe yes. um, uh, it's uh, one aspect that we also wanted to talk about is um, because this is American TV, and uh, uh, but American TV is not only experienced in uh, the US anymore. There is this uh, global aspect that uh, TV becomes this. Um, yeah, uh, almost like a monoculture, as you say. Um, so there is also there was a reception of um, American TV, also in Norway, which is why we thought it would be interesting to have this exhibition here, also um, as a uh, so the it's even though it's American uh, TV, it, it has a history in Norway. Um, from when on? What is your uh, yes. in your research? So uh, the thing is about American TV in Norway is, and I'm going to do try to do it a very short like history of broadcasting in Norway now. Uh, but as many of you know, we had a, we have the NRK, the public service broadcaster, and for a lot of years, like first of all, television 
came to Norway really late because the politicians thought that this isn't a good medium, like the idiot box that we were talking about. And they saw like what television was in the US and they were like, oh, we don't want this American dumb um, cultural artifacts here in Norway. So they were really slow in introducing TV. And when we first got TV, they were, of course, building it on the a British model, uh, the BBC and public service broadcasting. So we only had one Norwegian channel until the 80s when we finally got cable channels. So for a lot of years, the NRK were kind of deciding what kind of programs um, Norwegians were able to see. So a lot of the popular um, uh, popular uh, entertainment programs we saw were, for example, Derek, instead of <laughs> watching uh, the uh, American uh, crime shows. We got like, and we got a lot of BBC dramas, but, and, and the NRK were really skeptical, I think, uh, about a lot of American TV for a long time. So, for instance, instead of getting the American soap operas, the Norwegian audience, their first meeting with a soap opera was so a uh, parody, a sitcom parody of a soap opera. It was like the Norwegians' first meeting with the soap. So when <laughs> the NRK finally decided to air Dynasty, it was huge. And you must remember, we still only had this one channel. So everyone was watching and there are tales about like small towns shutting down completely because everyone was at home <laughs> watching dynasty <laughs> uh, so so that is kind of the the early history we have with American TV, it was something like a little bit scary, we didn't see that much, and then cable came. And then, of course, because it was so cheap, it was just flooded with American sitcoms. So this is when my generation come in, and we, I remember coming home from school and I was watching all of the 90s sitcom in, sitcoms in the US, like Fresh Prince in Bel Air, and Full House, and Family Matters, and <laughs> step by step, uh, and also like these uh, 80s action shows were super popular here, like the A-Team and Airwolf were <laughs> super popular, I remember. Uh, so then you finally got all of these American shows. So I think some of the shows that and sitcoms that Martin is referencing has never been aired here in Norway uh, because they're earlier than the 90s sitcoms. So this is... a uh, uh, history of television we don't really know here in Norway because like Sanford and Son um, is a, a show she references quite a lot. It was never aired here in Norway. So I think that's kind of interesting. I think the Cosby show was on, um, mm. but yeah. Uh, so I think our understanding of American TV is kind of like it's still now, of course, as I said earlier, like television culture is completely global and you can kind of watch everything on a streaming service. So if people wanted to in Norway, you could easily look up Sanford and Sons or Mary Tyler Moore and watch it. Uh, but yeah, for a long time, um, there was this, we don't have that same uh, television culture that is referenced in this work, so like this super commercialized industry and that created the sitcoms that are referenced um, in especially the first episode of She Mad. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting that, I mean, Europe has a completely different televisual history. In Europe, all television starts as public broadcasting. And so it has to be for the uh, BBC as this still in its uh, remit today. It has to be for the embetterment of the people. And so if you show something popular, it has to be shown with the purpose of drawing in audiences for the show that will actually embetter the people. And America, of course, has never had a similar, um, similar way of going about a business. So the American model and the European model, at least, are completely different. And that also speaks to genres. So the sitcom um, isn't actually in Europe the, the main televisual form. It's live entertainment, mm -hmm. or it's uh, talking heads. It's, it's diff variety show. It's different types of, of genres that were the key forms of television in, uh, and also for radio in Europe. And so I think in a way it's interesting that for us, um, this is recognizable 
in the same way, I'm guessing Mary Tyler Moore is recognizable to Oprah as sort of a second-hand memory of a second-hand memory, mm -hmm. right? We are appropriating this doubly because the sitcoms are a later, they, they come to us later, to all of us in Europe. And so we now remember TV as a sitcom form, but actually in Europe it wasn't a sitcom form at all. Yeah, that's interesting because yeah, so we, we know the kind of uh, the outcome basically, and uh, in a way it it offers some nerdy uh, <laughs> knowledge uh, that we never have experienced uh, yeah, firsthand. Yeah, um, maybe like uh, so th this kind of import of um, uh, American TV in uh, uh, Norway happened late, as you mentioned, and yeah, we, we know from. Uh, the Netherlands or Germany, uh, similar histories. I, it, sitcoms played uh, en masse in, uh, on cable TV. Mm. Um, but then, um, what is the next step? What is, what, what is happening? When uh, was, were these kind of formats, uh, so to speak, uh, absorbed in uh, national TV culture, would you say? Oh, Other formats? It did happen in the 90s. Mm. Um, and I think Norway got its own first Norwegian, like big sitcom. It was called Mutin Muti I didn't. I don't know if anyone remember that, uh, which was based on this um, American three-camera setup uh, studio sitcom with a live audience, and it was very farcical. And and so that happened, I think, in the 90s. It was a TV2 production, so of course it wasn't an arcade that created this uh, sitcom, but the commercial broadcaster that created it. And they also created the first, I think, or one of the first Norwegian uh, soap operas, which was uh, Sagan om de syv Sestre, uh, which was also uh, very popular. So it was this commercial commercialization of Norwegian TV that brought this uh, genres into like Norwegian production, um, which hadn't been there before, and that was probably because like because of cable we got these formats, and then they started creating Norwegian versions of it. But it was really late, like in the 90s. Mm. Mm. Uh, and before that, it was the miniseries. Usually, if you had drama yeah. series, um, a lot of the time. Should we make a jump and actually t <laughs> come from TV uh, proper? And it's, it's interesting, so we, we have uh, the one channel uh, uh, state TV, uh, we have uh, cable TV in which kind of a, a reception of uh, American television happens in Europe. But now, I mean, TV has changed a lot and actually also uh, the later episodes of uh, Martin Sims uh, project uh, really address uh, a change from uh, television as a kind of, um, a national um, uh, commercial or public uh, broadcasting system to something much more uh, yeah, uh, decentral, web-based, um, streaming services, etc., which is uh, also actually the format in which uh, what you described as uh, kind of the quality TV, uh, uh, I guess, uh, happened mostly through, I don't know, The Wire was not streamed yet, but um, I guess... Um, the nichification of uh -huh. television. Cable. Yeah. Yes, yeah. cable. So, it's, yeah. yeah. That was the early 2000s, I would say, yeah. and yeah. No, but then um, I mean it's interesting because the the, the kind of the, the move to web-based uh, services and um, yeah, what you have researched on a lot. Uh, yes, so of course the internet has changed how we watch television a lot. Not it is completely a game changer. I would actually say that for the serial formats and how dramas um, evolved, it was actually the VHS uh, that was the most important because then you could actually tape episodes in case you missed one. So that allowed for more serialization. And so the DVD box set was a continuation of that, and now binging is kind of like the latest iteration of this way of watching, like binging, watching serialized shows. Um, so I think it's important to also acknowledge that what we are watching now isn't entirely new. Like what Netflix mm -hmm. are showing us is actually a lot of old TV and um, new, uh, there is so much like 
reality shows, dating shows, like lifestyle TV. It's all on Netflix. There you, should, you can usually find it under the rubric uh, relaxing TV. <laughs> so it's kind of very obvious. Uh, and there you find like the sitcom. So they're kind of operating in the blocks of programming that television channels did before. Like when I came home from school, as I said, and I just put on TV and there all of the sitcoms were and the soap operas and the stupid action shows and the lifestyle shows. And I, it was relaxing. I was doing my homework while watching and TV, right? And this is what um, a lot of Netflix is doing too. This is the function of Netflix. You just put it on and then it's just flowing there in the background, right? Uh, so that's one part of it, of course. But I think what you want us to talk mm -hmm. about is how social media yeah. is affecting television and how that is actually representing something completely new. So Netflix, not new, but social media and television merging with social media is actually a new format. And I think that's really interesting because... Um, you are kind of merging the affordances of television, which is liveness and flow and all of these words and characteristics with uh, social media where you have like the stream and real time and, and, and they're kind of merging them into a new way in which to tell a story. And I think here in Norway, Scum is the most um, famous example of that. Actually, I think Scum might be the fam most famous example of that in the world because it was such a huge global hit, which also points to a new development in television, how these shows are able to travel online. Uh, so uh, Scum would never ever have become this huge global hit 10 years ago because you didn't have the broadband with <laughs> to, uh, for this to happen. But what happened with Scum was that people in um, uh, other countries like China was uh, discovering it, and they were put, subtitling it, putting it online, so suddenly Scum had millions and millions. I think uh, I saw that a billion viewers in China <laughs> probably watched it, <laughs> because it was so popular, and that was a Norwegian show online pirated with fan-made subtitles. Uh, and I think that is very new, and it says something about uh, uh, the democratization of TV. Like, what we have been talking about is television industries, right? It's very expensive to make, and you have to go through the broadcasting companies and the production companies, and then you make TV. But now you kind of see that uh, this uh, opening of, for, uh, first of all, like cheaper digital technology and also this, these new uh, ways of distribution on social media platforms, you can actually create TV quite cheap and you could also uh, distribute it to the entire world. So we see a lot of movements now where people are making television for social media platforms like Instagram or of course TikTok is the biggest now or YouTube and you also see this democratization of TV. Like, uh, for instance, Issa Rae, who is making Insecure, she started out making a web television show and she was discovered on YouTube and then she ended up with her own show on HBO. So it's also a way that you kind of go from this making social media television to uh, being able to move into the industry proper, as you say. Yeah, with the important, I, th I mean, it's, I think it's obvious, but with the important addendum that this democratization of television isn't a post or alter or outside of capital, right? It's just of alternative course. models of yeah. money making in a way. Just, I think it's important to say, yeah. I mean, someone is making money, even if the producer themselves aren't necessarily making money. Yeah.
I mean, though scum is probably yeah, an yeah. exception. <laughs> Why? Oh, uh, because it was pirated uh, oh, yeah, and yeah. it was public service. So the NRK yeah, yeah. didn't make any money on this huge popularity of the show. And the pirates didn't either, but the platforms hosting those pirates, <laughs> of <Yes>. course, did. <laughs> no, just like I hope that the actors made some money. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like... Uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, should we watch the, this clip that you uh, suggested to show uh, yeah, and watch? We um, do that. Yeah. Do you want to introduce it? Uh, uh, so this yeah. clip is from, I think, probably one of the best television shows that have been made over the last five years, perhaps. Uh, it's called "I May Destroy You." Some of you might have seen it already. It was very popular a couple of years ago. Uh, it follows. Um, I think she's called Michaela Cole, uh, and it's based on her life. She's um, British uh, in the story. She is a British author, and she realizes that she has been sexually assaulted. And then during, and it's about like dealing with that, that trauma. The show kind of deals with different stories of sexual assault and how you deal with it. Uh, so, in the clip we are going to watch, uh, what has happened is that she has, she realizes that she has been assaulted again because she had, and I'm spoiling it now, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's fine, um, realized that she has been, uh, according to British law, been raped because she had sex with this guy and he took off the condom without her knowledge, and that's a rape. And, and so she doxes him, and she hangs him out online. And uh, what we're going to see is the reaction uh, she experienced after doing this publicly online on social media. I, and uh, we're showing this, and we don't show it uh, online because of uh, copyright issues. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I think those are two very good questions uh, to end on for us all. Uh, and, but I think what I think is very interesting uh, with I May Destroy You is how it uses television, but also it, it, it's probably one of the best representations of social media and social media use I've seen on TV, uh, and how they're representing this. She's both feeling so empowered by doxing and doing this um, action, uh, and she feels all the support, but also all the hatred. Uh, and I kind of love it that she's like walking around just interacting with the screen and all of these likes and dislikes and emojis floating around and all of these like anonymous um, uh, DM she's getting. And then you see her ending up at her therapist's office in a... Uh, uh, personal, uh, physical uh, setting, and the therapist is just like, do you need social media? Can you quit social media? And I think it's such a clever way to kind of show how, like, how social media is problematic, and it's kind of not probably the best influence in <laughs> our lives. And you see that in the research, of course, too. Like, uh, young girls are developing eating disorders and everything because of this, because of these pressures of social media. So, uh, and it kind of also speaks to Martine's work because uh, they are dealing with a lot of the same themes, they're in the same generation, so uh, I think it's kind of interesting to see that in relationship with her work. Yeah, I mean, especially, I mean, I think two things. There, it's the first, of course, is that this is so, I mean, for those of you who've seen it, it's quite interesting that the aesthetic of this scene, which is one that uh, is quite well established in films about London and about Soho, where we often have the sort of neon aesthetic, but this repeats aesthetically the scene earlier in the show where she has just been raped and she has uh, had a, a roofie, or how do you call it, and she's sort of completely dazed walking through the London streets at night. And it's the same kind of neon coloring, it's the same kind of disorientation of the camera, moving back and forth, going in and out of focus. And we see here that the moment she's sort of going through another kind of um, traumatic experience and relaying that and having that disorientation of the variety of the screen and the reality and so on and so forth, it's a very similar aesthetic, a similar kind of neon coloring, similar kind of uh, movement of the cameras, similar walking. She's walking and sort of talking through the city in a sort of surreal or magical real way. So it's a, it's a repetition of steps, which I think is very interesting. The trauma and then the repetition or the consideration or the distribution of trauma and its responses online really seem to mimic that. And of course, it also really reminds me of the dentist uh, scene in, in Martina Sims' work, where we have a similar kind of I would say, I mean, I don't know about the coloring, because of course purple is very important, it seems, in many of the work, but I'm not sure if it was important in the, the, dentist, uh, the dentist piece, but it's a similar kind of in and out, you see, sort of in and out of the world um, in that uh, hallucinatory, on painkiller state. So I, I think it's an interesting companion piece in, in that Absolutely. sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we reached also actually the end of our time soon, um, but um, are there questions uh, that you... Somebody wants to have a say, a comment, or a... Yeah, <laughs> we, we need to use the microphone, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Hi, so thank you both. Um, I just have a question about this thing with binging and what that does to us as consumers and viewers of TV or uh, shows, but also what it does to the medium itself, um, because it seems to me that never before have we had higher demands on what we want, the quality. I mean, at least sort of how we have been following sitcoms and following shows and we're looking for the good quality and the good TV shows that we are, to, the actors need to be great, the, the setting, everything. And then we watch it over two days mm -hmm. and then we go over to the next one. So how is that when we consume these these shows in such a speed. Um, and I was just wondering what, if you have any thoughts around that, where will this lead us? <laughs> where will it end? 
Shall I go first to you? you can. I mean, of course, that's the, it's the attitude of the manic, right? The binge is, the, is a manic attitude, and it goes entirely against... I mean, I think there's some shows that are really... You can do well binging, and others that aren't really affording the process of binging. And if you do binge them, you're, of course, not getting so much out of it. Because binging is a narrative thing, right? It's the, the, the addict to the narrative. You're constantly going through. It's not the moment where you stop and then watch the scenery for a while or wonder why Donald Draper is pushed against the hallway door or why you wonder why Bill Rawls is suddenly in a gay bar in the wire midway through the season, right? So that's not the kind of stuff you, you, pay, pay, you look out for. You're narratively engaged, right? You're going further and further. I think another trend, apparently, I hear from my students, is to watch movies on, on double speed, which also <laughs> seems yeah. completely, like, that seems so perverse to me, right? But it, it's, it's the same kind of manic attitude that I imagine is both given by the flood of stuff that's available, but of course also by society and capital and the way in which it impinges on our time and our sense of time and temporalization more generally. So it seems to be a, a manic behavior that is at once you know, encouraged or afforded by the flood, by having everything available all at once, and by the way in which we are supposed to, to behave, to engage with time more generally. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's the way in which many of us work, right? <laughs> we work manically for a number of days really hard, and then we take some days off. But so it's, uh, I think it's generally a more sort of a, a distinct quality of, of capital. Yeah. Does that answer it? I don't know, Gri, if you want to add something? Yeah, I don't know. I was just outed at the NRK website as the person who watched the television 70, 17 hours straight in, in one day. So, <laughs> <laughs> But what, interestingly enough, that was not Netflix, it was not streaming, it was the OC DVDs. Mm. <laughs> uh, but so, so binging isn't that new. It yeah. has been going on since we got like the DVD box sets. Um, but I think what Tim says, uh, I think that uh, some uh, shows, and Netflix are making shows that are made for yeah. binging. Like uh, the Squid Game, for example, is kind of made for binging. You always have these cliffhangers at the end, like the soap opera had uh, when uh, they, uh, or still have, so we kind of have to continue watching. Um, but I also think that there are some shows that are made to be watched weekly, and then you actually get the anticipation watching it, you got the conversation, you get the discourse like Succession. I think it's very smart for Succession and HBO to keep their once a week episode because it gets people talking between the episodes. And the gaps has always been very important in serialized storytelling. Like when Dickens did it, he knew that people would talk between mm. the episodes in a way. And that's very interesting. So I think you will, at one hand, have those Netflix shows like Stranger Things and Squid Game, which are made for binging. And then you will still have the shows that are made to be thought about and talked about. And it will be distributed in weekly episodes. And it's also about who can afford to do... I mean, Netflix is, of course, the prime medium for binging. Right? I mean, other than YouTube or something. But Netflix is really the prime platform for binging because they are, you know, like Boymont's opening their archive to the public, that's Netflix, right? Netflix is just literally the entire archive is there. And then depending on who you are and your viewing preferences, your class and your gender and your race and all of those things, you get a distinct set of stuff that you watch. So you see a particular route through that archive and you don't see any of the other stuff because it's too much. It will be like a sublime like some kind of Friedrich experience, I guess, right? So you see a particular kind of pattern through that archive, but Amazon and HBO, which have far less content as of yet, they are also sort of forced to do that week by week because they can't really compete with Netflix. They cannot really offer you that same experience. And so Curb or May Destroy, which it, I, it wasn't originally on HBO, I, I reckon, BBC. but on BBC. It was a co-production. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they have to also sort of do it more in, a, in an other form because that keeps us coming back. Right? Because otherwise we might not go back to Amazon Prime or HBO because there isn't so much on. <laughs> <laughs> and Netflix can literally, you can keep going back. There's always some new shit. Yeah.
Is that the last Thanks word? That's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we have to keep it. Yeah, let's keep it there. Thank you so much. Tim. Um, Tim. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for inviting <laughs> Thank you. us. Yes.